For nearly a hundred years, television has been at the forefront of our society. Almost as soon as it was invented, it began to change the world. It enhanced science, technology, education, and community. It stimulated the economy and created jobs. It formed new skylines and completely changed the aesthetics of the home. It connected people to sports, politics, current events, and most importantly, to one another. It shaped our culture in ways previously unknown, and today, barely a facet of our lives is untouched by television. The Academy has been awarding excellence in TV for almost 75 years, but we felt the need to recognize shows that both create awareness and offer themselves as a catalyst for change. So in 2008, the first Television Academy Honors Awards were given. I got into television right out of college because I believed uh, that it was the best medium to influence people, inspire them, to change their thoughts, and to move their hearts. We each have a story to tell. And when we share those stories with one another, we will realize that there are fundamental threads weaving all of our narratives together. I think people are inherently good, and the programs that people are choosing to devote their time to make is proof of that. Every day in the writer's room, we try to write stories that matter and to do some good. This medium can work when it's done right. For the past 15 years, the honorees have shed light on the most relevant topics of our time. And this year's recipients exemplify why television is the most powerful medium of the past century. Fox Gordon. Fucking red dogs. Can I be Mr. Camouflage? Reservation Dogs is a story about four indigenous youths who recently lost their friend and they're planning to leave home and go to California. Taika Waititi and I had been friends for a long time. You know, every time I would come to town, we would have dinner. And he mentioned that he had an overall deal at FX, and he said, if you ever have any ideas, let me know. And so we came up with it that night. Whenever we hung out, we always talked about our backgrounds and the fact that we're from different countries and different areas, very similar backgrounds. And we talked about you know, making a show, make, telling a story where uh, we could break free of the traditional uh, tropes with native content. The show is largely based on my life and aspects of a lot of the writers' lives. Having everyone that has lived in different reservations across uh, the United States in Native communities. Bring their experience to the story really helped kind of expand the world and tell a more honest, truthful, sort of broader depiction of Native life. Anyone we can call? I live with my uncle. Great. Who's your uncle? Charlie Johnson. Oh, Charlie. Hansy. That guy, he texts me all the time. The reason I wanted to make a show about Indigenous people in America was really, I mean, because most of my friends here are Native Americans. And that was sort of like the only, my only real experience of America, really, for a long time, was just these people. And I loved the stories. And also just coming from home, being here, you latch onto something that makes you feel like you're at home. I mean, for an Indigenous and Native project, I think that it's really important to shoot on the land in which you are depicting because land is so important to Native people, because they've mostly been displaced from land. So we shot in Oklahoma on the Muscogee Reservation, and there's nothing that looks like it on TV, like, like just because of where we shot it. And I think people really enjoy that aesthetic that runs throughout the whole show. Sir, there's no toilet paper. Sir, there's no What's toilet that? paper. What was that? That's, that's someone on the shooter. Go, hey, no, keep, keep your gun on her. There's no toilet paper. Ma'am, don't turn around. Ma'am, what the shit you doing? What the shit you doing? I'll, this thing will blow. I'll blow it. I never used this before. Hello, I need help. What makes the show different is that 
It's really the first time I think there's been a real truthful depiction of Native people on screen. And I think that humor is such a part of Native people's life and culture that to show any depiction of them without humor is false. Nothing like it's ever been done before and like to show what it's like to live on a reservation and to do it so truthfully. And the whole starring cast is natives. And... It's about time. It's I about just... time. It's like my dream show. But watch out on Mondays here. Lots of folks show up. Means lots of bad medicine. Someone throw a curse on you. You wake up as a white man. Whenever I started realizing the show was at least successful in, with Native people was just like the memes that started rolling in like after the first episode aired. And it just has not ever quit since. You know, I think people are very proud of it because it is truthful. Just to see online like people making fan art and all like the response the show's been getting. Like you see Halloween, oh my gosh. There's so many Red Dogs on Halloween. There's a lot. I was really excited to watch, to see a young Native girl dress up as Paulina, not the character Willie Jack, but Paulina the actress as she was at the Emmys in the same dress. It feels amazing, man. Like, I get to be a role model for all these kids and stuff and show them that, that they can do it too. Yo! Hey! Indy Mafia have been telling everybody they at war with y'all. Yeah. Told them y'all was the reservation dogs. Since y'all didn't like res bandits. My hope is that, yeah, that it opens doors for many other genres and many other styles because Native people are always the last in the conversation. Just being seen or being recognized, you know, for our work is great. I mean, just the recognition and, and the honors award is, was super exciting. It's been like, you know, you're sort of like climbing hills where it's like, oh, like Native people like the show, great. Uh, or, oh, other people like the show, right? Oh, critics like the show. Oh, cool, now they're giving us awards. It's all very gratifying and cool to see that happen, especially for a show that's sort of a first of its kind. I literally watch everything. I watch an insane amount of television. I love Hacks. I just thought that was amazing. I'm dying to watch season two. I like comedy and I love romance. And I think about um, a different world with Whitney and Dwayne. I'm learning something new. I do, <laughs> I do. A different world, Fresh Prince and Living Single. I just have them on constantly. I watch all reality and true crime, everything. I love Ozark, I love Stranger Things. I just finished uh, Severance, which was, whoo, like one of the best season finales I've seen in a minute. If I could spend my day watching Squid Game and Golden Girls, I'd be very, very happy. They're as different as they can be, but they're both, I think, brilliant. I'm probably the last person in Britain still watching soap operas of an evening. I love the evening soap opera. I'd say my favorite show of the last year was Winning Time, the show about the Lakers. Just loved it. I just like anything that tells me something about the world I didn't know before and surprises me, really. Globally, turtle numbers have been in steep decline, partly because they have been reluctant to visit the ever busier beaches. The Year Earth Changed is a one hour documentary for Apple TV Plus, which was about what happened to planet Earth during the pandemic. When we were all kept inside and couldn't be out doing our normal lives, how did the natural world respond to that? Is the natural world really dramatically changing or is it just kind of on the surface? We wanted to study what happened when, when uh, there were no people around to muck things up for the natural world. You can imagine if you were trying to communicate with your friends and you're in a crowded bar, it's hard to do. And you don't say as much. And when you do, you sort of have to scream. But if you find yourself in a nice, quiet coffee shop where there isn't much noise, you can carry on a much more elaborate and, and productive conversation. But there's something even more surprising. Now, the whales can communicate across greater distances without interruption. And some mothers, like this one, leave their calves alone. An extremely rare sight. Making a film about the pandemic, during a pandemic, is probably the hardest thing I've ever had to be involved in. Nobody was going anywhere, and that includes film crews. I actually hired Tom because I thought he was a kind of game-changing director. 
we were taking a gamble, I guess. We didn't know which stories were actually going to pay off or not, but we had to decide this one's looking likely. The scientists are telling us there could be some change here. We reckon we might see it actually happening. Uh, and then can we get a camera crew there to film it? Our cameraman, working with local researchers, is lucky enough to film here on Juno Beach, one of the densest nesting sites for loggerhead turtles in the world. As the breeding season begins, this female is able to lay her eggs in peace for the first time in her life. I mean, the Natural History Unit is unique in that we always have in-country camera people and in-country researchers and producers. It was kind of insane trying to make a film without actually getting on planes and going to do actual filming. We started out by contacting scientists across the world. I think we contacted over 160 different organisations. Although we didn't have a huge choice of stories because of the logistical reason, we were able to just choose the ones that we felt most and best illustrated both the challenges that Mother Nature faces, but also some of the more hopeful outcomes that emerged as we started to make this, the show. I had shoots going on in Alaska, in Florida, in South Africa, India and Japan pretty much concurrently. You had to sort of pick and choose a little bit which days you're going to focus on which shoots. In pre-COVID times, you'll find one out of three cubs will survive. But currently, we are coming across more cubs that are more than three months old, which makes us optimistic that this time around, we are going to have more cubs surviving, which means more cheetahs. Every day, we were discovering new things. And the scientific community, you know, the natural history community, the people who watch and observe and record animals, were, were just blown away by what was what was happening. A lot of people reassess their relationship with nature. I think I've realized through making the film that we're totally interconnected with nature. This whole idea that man, humans and the, the natural world are separate is is kind of ridiculous really and we're all part of the same complicated system and the more we think like that, the better. If people took um climate change as seriously as they took COVID, um, we might all be in a better place. I think people uh, really see the lessons that can be learned. I mean, you know, it's not a subtle message. The astonishing speed and variety of nature's response has shown that even modest changes to our lives can make a vital difference to wildlife around the world. Having this program acknowledged by the Academy is a surprise. You know, it's a pinnacle of, of achievement. It's going to have pride of place on my bookshelf, that's for sure. I know the team that, that put it together, all the, the crews around the world that took part in this, that made it possible, all the scientists that were doing the work through difficult conditions and throughout lockdown. It rewards all of them, I think, as well. It, it's great that the, the Academy have, have recognised it. So exciting to be acknowledged. I guess this award is about um, films that can potentially make a difference, can kind of change the world a bit. And obviously that's um, enormously exciting and a huge honour. Uh, I love comp cooking competition shows. Anything cooking competition, I'm all here for. So I watch a lot of barbecue cooking competition shows as, at the end of the night to like just, here's my scotch and here's my barbecue and the show <laughs> and I'm gonna just come down. The show I'll always keep putting on, because the great love of my life is Doctor Who. So of a quiet afternoon, you'll probably see me pressing play on something from 1973 from that show. I love it. The English Office, I know all of the jokes and pretty much all the dialogue that's comforting and, and, and light and humorous. The 10 o'clock news on Channel 9, especially if there's a car, car chase on the freeway. The first 48 I will put on if I just want to relax, you know, <laughs> turn my, just turn my mind off, just watch a good old murder. And it's terrible, <laughs> it's terrible. I'd been living with pain for so long, but then almost overnight, I got my life back. Dope Sick is the story of the opioid crisis 
seen through multiple lenses, through the prosecutors and the DEA agents that were bringing a case against Purdue Pharma that was run by the Sackler family. And then we also follow a small town in Appalachia as we watch people get addicted because they are manipulated and deceived by the lies of the sales reps that worked at Purdue. Less than 1% of people get addicted to Oxycontin. That's not possible. But it is. The FDA actually created a special label to say that it's less addictive than other opioids. Right there. I had read a story in The New Yorker about the Sacklers, and I thought that it was the most remarkable villain I'd ever encountered, ever. So I called Danny Strong, uh, and Danny was looking at the time for something kind of causey to do, and I sent him the article. Once I started doing some research and reading about it, I was completely riveted and fascinated and deeply disturbed by the actions of this company. One of the reasons I wanted to do this was to shed light on the, the topic, uh, uh, not just of addiction, but really uh, corporate America and society, really, and the inequities and economically. I thought, okay, not only could this be a really enlightening, uh, hopefully important piece of muckraking, but it could also function as an exciting piece of entertainment. I'd like to ask you some questions about break-ins at pharmacies in the area. Well, I didn't do it. I would never risk scratching my new Manolos. You're not a suspect, ma'am. Several of the pharmacists complained they were told they had to carry Oxycontin when they didn't want to. Who told them that? They said you did. So the book came out in 2018. There was a bidding war for it. And I chose Warren Littlefield and, and the Fox Group. And when it was announced, another division of Fox went, oh, we already have an opioid project. And so they paired me together with Danny Strong to see if our visions for how to tell the story of how the opioid crisis began uh, synced, and they very much did. Danny did a tremendous amount of research. Beth Macy is an investigative journalist, so tremendous resources, and it's um, incredibly accurate. I thought, great, to have an expert on the opioid crisis in the writer's room full time. How could that not be helpful? So she came aboard the, uh, part of the team, and she's just been an incredible asset every step of the way through. I call her national treasure, Beth Macy. No one in the history of this family will ever come close to accomplishing what we're going to do. We're going to cure the world of its pain. To kick us off, we needed our Dr. Phoenix. We needed that moral center. We needed the doctor that we all wish we could have in our lives. It was sort of a real sort of, you know, long shot from our point of view. I mean, it was sort of a dream idea. And Michael Keaton said yes. And it really kind of blew the whole show wide open. There was so much interest amongst talent. So many people wanted to be a part of it. Dr. Phoenix. Oxycontin. So just to be clear, you're blaming numerous deaths in your town on just one medication? Yes, sir. I am. And are you the individual that prescribed this medication? <clears throat> yes, sir. Dr. Phoenix is actually a created person, loosely based on uh, a doctor who's in Beth Macy's book. But really, Danny had to create a kind of an amalgamation of different types of doctors and created Dr. Phoenix. I think he's one of those actors that the moment he opens his mouth, you just believe him and you believe that he is that character. Caitlin Deaver is such a great young woman, but really a wonderful actress. She was just so easy and her character is so enormously sympathetic. So I've got two options. I can uh, switch you to a different medication. No. I I don't want to switch. This works better than anything I've ever used before. Okay, well, option two is I can double your dose to 20 milligrams. But if that doesn't work, we're going to switch you to something else. The show has essentially redefined the nature of addiction for a lot of people. That's amazing to have a show that makes an impact on stigma and helps inform. When you get the combination of something that's really just good and captivating, that combined with what this is about and the potential to actually change things, uh, that's pretty rare. We gave dignity to people who unwittingly put their faith in a drug that they were told by 
the doctor that they trusted in their community would ease their suffering. We've had impact. We're hoping for some justice with the Sackler family. The Met took the Sacklers' name down. The Guggenheim took their names down. And I think it's this incremental buildup, and hopefully they will have to pay. You ever think that um, maybe that miracle drug you're selling is just, you know, just a tad more addictive than you said? It's not easy to get projects like this made that have a social justice bent to them. And for the uh, Television Academy to honor them, to shine a light on them, to be part of that group that's been honored is quite exciting and quite thrilling, to be honest with you. You know, we all came together to make something that we were all passionate about, the crew, the cast, everybody. To, to receive that kind of love, it feels really good, but then to have this kind of honor is even more exciting. It's uh, wonderfully satisfying. I think for me, it's one of the reasons I do what I do. Oh, forget it, I mean, this is, you know, I'm grateful for, for anything. I'm grateful for somebody walking up the street saying, hey, I really liked you in that series. That's good, that's good right there. And so to be included in that and to be honored is, is, is just that, really, really honestly, an honor, I'm extraordinarily grateful. I think what motivated me to action um, was watching the television news coverage in the late 60s of the Vietnam War. My motivation to fight against the Vietnam War came from those journalists who brought that war into my home when I was a teenager. Watching a doc about the Exxon Valdez oil spill, that was a pretty big instigated for me and just wanting to, yeah, do something to make sure the natural world was was there forever. You know? I grew up kind of watching CNN when Christiane Amanpour was reporting a lot. She did educate us on a very human and approachable level about what was going on. I remember um, a different world had an episode about the LA uprising. For me, that was really formative. A lot of those, a lot of those cultural moments I learned about through TV. For me, it was uh, watching the first season of Saturday Night Live. My takeaway from that was don't be afraid to break rules. Watching Atlanta changed my idea of what a TV show could be, and that it doesn't have to be just one thing, and it can break rules from everything that's ever happened up to this point. We didn't just blissfully go down and greet the pilgrims and go, oh, welcome, we have turkey, you know. Want an apple pie? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what was taught to me as a product of the U.S. school, public school system, is that, you know, at Plymouth Bra, yeah. the pilgrims, they had a really hard winter. They shared food and that it was peaceful. I mean, we don't know if it was peaceful. Very shortly after the 2016 election, I was really disturbed by what I heard about immigrants and who we were. I really wanted to do something in my professional life, artistically and creatively, that would allow me to show rather than just say without obviously getting on my soapbox. It's really looking at immigrant communities in this country, but also indigenous communities that often don't get the play in media, but are super interesting and are every bit as American as anyone else that's here. And we do it through the lens of food. Jews were charting a new American way of life. Community was the spark, but the lingua franca was food. So much was changing, including Hanukkah. The food is an excuse to really get to know a community. And with the holiday edition, it was so specific, and people have such emotional connections to the foods they eat in the holidays. And to share that intimate act of cooking for special occasions with their families, it gives you a window into people's lives and souls that I think was really, really uh, great for us. Anna Sophia may swap out pork from time to time, but her recipe's roots are still with her grandparents, who fled Cuba in the early 60s. I would spend so much time with them, sit in their kitchen, and he and my grandmother would spend all day cooking. You know, one time we asked them, like, who taught you how to cook? And they said, exile. Because that was, you know, that's how they, they discovered it for themselves. 
This country was founded on generations upon generations of all different immigrants who really built this nation to what it is. And it's so particular to our country more than any other country. And I thought that was interesting. We don't have to be afraid of diversity. Actually, it is the thing that makes us the most special. It was very clear, like, I didn't fully belong in Korea. And I didn't really fully belong in the suburbs of Atlanta either. In K-Town, we all come from this background of we are oddly Korean and American and their culture at the same time. It is really cool to be able to see people embrace this third culture identity and embrace everything because we don't have to fit into a single box. It does, who, why should we fit into a single box? Taste the Nation is coming out in a time when we really need to understand each other. People are so much more polarized, but also looking for ways to connect positively and with empathy and greater understanding. And so food is great as a gateway, a conversation starter to understanding. Nobody leaves home because they want to. Nobody leaves their culture, their language, their family, their traditions, their history, because they're like, eh, that right. doesn't happen. Honestly, the fan response from people who've watched Taste the Nation has been incredible. Many people cry when they watch it. A lot of people laugh out loud because they go, oh yeah, my family's like that too. I hope that Taste the Nation does inspire uh, a greater curiosity about our neighbors, a bigger sense of empathy, and also uh, connection. This is something that we need to remember, that this is our place. I think that we're all really proud that we're still here. The Wampanoag people are here. They've always been here, and they didn't come from somewhere else. We are still here. We're still here. We're not something of the past. We still exist. Our culture hasn't been wiped out like so many people think. It's still a beautiful, immersed culture that has background and meaning. Taste Nation has honestly been um, the best creative experience of my life. To actually envision a show, get to work with people who share your vision is really rare. Only thing you can ask for in life is to do what you love and also have it serve a purpose that you think should be your North Star. What was it like growing up at the shop? I grew up thinking that when you walked into a food store, you hugged and kissed the owners, because that's what I saw my parents doing in Russ and Daughters. With everybody. With everybody. Yeah. And everyone told their story. It really wasn't until I got older that I realized, oh, this doesn't happen everywhere. Hear <laughs> okay, that sound? Sound of joy is what that is. It feels so great to be acknowledged in this way by the Academy. Taste the Nation means the world to me, and I poured all my heart and soul into it. I'm greatly honored, and um, I don't know, I'm just thankful. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. My guilty pleasure show is the Parisian Agency. Oh, it's fantastic. It, uh, right? It's so good. Right, right. So, uh, so unscripted good. show, and it's real estate porn, and family dynamics, it's and good. it's just a hoot. It's my lottery dream home that comes on on Fridays. <laughs> yes. Again, it goes back, but I just love David. Look. <laughs> Bridgerton, because the Duke of Hastings, who, who wouldn't want to watch him? I like a good episode of Million Dollar Listing, so. Judge me, go ahead, I don't care. But I think that Tracy has something special. My guilty pleasure show is Outlander, which my husband calls softcore porn, Scottish porn. It's so good. I watched Love is Blind, The Circle, F-Boy Island. Oh, The Ultimatum. Any dating show where people go on and essentially throw away their relationship, I'm invested and I'm watching. I don't ever feel guilt in any pleasure I take. Is this what you always want to do? Uh, no. I, but I got this job after college and it fit my interest at the time. Are you single? Uh, I don't think that's appropriate. <laughs> yes, you single. Insecure is a show about two black friends who are exploring their friendship, love, life, in LA. I lived in Inglewood while I was developing the show, and to me it was just so beautiful and it's so culturally rich that I wanted to 
reflect how I saw it on TV. I had only seen the neighborhood that I lived in glorified for its violence or um, that was depicted as scary. I was frustrated. The title Insecure was really important to her. It was an idea that she hadn't seen when she was growing up on television. So she wanted to put that out into the world for other people and other generations to see. I just wanted to create a space for us, you know, where, where black excellence could be on display. And what a diverse crowd. Uh-huh and I am fine with that. <laughs> I really just connected to the material, and for me, it was just really refreshing to see us kind of be able to play in a very normal space where it's not about our tragedy or our pain. It was about our dreams and our hopes and all that. I remember reading it and immediately it was like, oh, I've never seen anything like this before because we were seeing a guy who was definitely depressed but didn't know he was depressed. And we don't often get depictions of black men like that on television. We don't get to see vulnerability like that. Lawrence, I want it to be better for you, because of you. But somewhere along the way, I depended on you to be better for both of us. And when you were going through what you were going through, I just didn't know how to handle it. I think what makes this show groundbreaking is actually we're just seeing black people live like very normal, un unspecial lives. I think the reason why that show is so important at that specific time, right? I sort of mark it as like an Obama presidency gives birth to say like we should make shows like Insecure, right? But then the Trump presidency comes in and goes, but here's why you need to see it now because it's happening in the world. These were stories about my real life friends. These were stories about black people coming of age in their adulthood into adulthood. And they were just real life, romantic, friendship-centered, relatable stories about people just trying to find themselves. When I hear, oh, it's the Asian insecure, where it's like, usually sh like black shows are not the benchmark. It's usually like we're trying to fit into somebody else's thing. So the fact that other people that are saying, oh, I want to be the white insecure, or the, the, this, that, it, to me, it really says like, oh, there's a benchmark of what this show represents. How do black businesses always have to be on the struggle? I'm with Molly on this one. We have to do better. We can't just leave it all up to Chadwick Boseman. Right? I mean, if you're going to be a black law firm in Century City, then be a Century City law firm. It's like when black people buy big ass houses that can't furnish it. Y'all know my uncle got an 8,000 square feet house and just a bean bag? When Princess and I formed the writers' room, we knew that we would we wanted predominantly black women to tell the stories of these two black female characters. I just always encouraged our writers and 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 myself included to really dig deep into our personal lives and share those things that we thought could help make the show better. So a lot of times, like the whole Issa Molly friend breakup was really based on other friends talking about their friend breakups and what that was like. We were sharing so much of ourselves in service of the story and discovering so many things. It was just so pure and we really got to put ourselves literally into these characters. You okay? Yeah. I'm fine, it's just... <sighs> there goes my girl. Come on. Getting a chance to work with Issa on the show has been amazing. Because she so clearly saw the vision, we were so able to clearly see the vision as well, and we knew what we were doing. Whether she was there as an actor, whether she was there as a producer, whether she was writing, with all the hats that she wore, she did it with such grace. It's always just been just very collaborative, just trying to find what's the best version of this scene, the best version of this episode, the best version of this character. So like for that, you know, working with her is just great because there's no ego involved. It's just about trying to like make it be everything it can be. Since you guys are so interested in my personal life, here it is. I'm 28. Actually, 29, because today's my birthday. Uh, I came from a great family. I have a college degree. I work in the nonprofit world because I like to give back. I've been with my boyfriend for five years, and I did this to my hair on purpose. Issa always had something that she wanted to say in such a, a clear voice as a comedic auteur. And so to get this recognition, I think, is just an acknowledgment of that and who she is as, as a talent. When you get these sort of like notifications that your show is going to be honored or you're being honored because you're like, I grew up wanting to do this. And so the fact that like you always hear about the Academy, the Academy, the Academy. So to be like, oh, the Academy likes your show, you're just like, wow, that's like 
I'm in the I'm in the ballpark or something. To be able to be honored is, I mean, what else could you ask for? Like, it's a dream. This show changed my life in so many ways. It, it instilled, ironically, a, like a confidence in me as a creator, as a writer. To be a Television Academy honor, like that is, that's huge. And that's not something that when I was sitting down in front of my computer, staring at a blank page that I imagined. I grew up watching after school specials. So I learned never to drink and drive. Don't get lost in the mall without your parents. We just discovered she's pregnant or he's smoking pot. What's the family gonna do? I think that was the first time that I realized like, oh, an entire show can be completely created to make you feel a certain way, to want to leave watching and do something about this thing that you've just seen. I think those after school specials were really impactful on me. They, you know, made me really empathetic towards different social issues. And I think that the, the goal of those filmmakers uh, and those writers really affected me as a 10, 11, 12 year old watching these shows about issues of racism and, and sexuality and bullying. And I think it had such a positive effect. And I'm sorry, but all we want to do is see him and say hello and give him our love. He died yesterday. Yesterday afternoon. It's a Sin is a five episode drama about a bunch of friends who meet in 1981. They go to London, they move to the big city. The show follows the entire decade, but of course that's the decade where the HIV virus arrived. AIDS hits their lives and it shows them coping and surviving and not surviving and living that decade. A lot of it is based on my life. I was 18 in 1981, just like these characters, and it's every story I've ever heard, and, and it comes from all these decades of me hearing a lot of stories about HIV and AIDS and working on what hasn't been said on screen and what should be said on screen, so, yeah, brought an awful lot of my own history to it in the end. I've been wanting to tell you for a really, really long time, and I know I fucked things up because I didn't know how to say it, but it's actually really, really simple because I've got some news for you. I've got news for you all. I wanted you to be the first to know. I'm gonna live. That it's naturally a very, very sad story and a cruel story in places, but um, that's not the way I remember my friends. The people who died, I remember us laughing and having a great time in the 80s when we were young, and I wanted to capture that. I, I, wanted, I wanted to go light on the deaths without without cheating or without skipping them, but actually it was the, the life that was lived that I wanted to remember. And a great cast came together and a great director and they really got a kind of energy and life to it that I think worked. I'm really proud of that. The cunning of her passion invites me in this churlish messenger. None of my lords reign. Why, he sent her none. I am the man. <laughs> you kind of embark on a programme about HIV and AIDS thinking, wow, maybe a worthy drama, and who wants to watch that? And who wants to watch that in a time of a new virus coming along? I think that young cast in particular captured people's minds and imaginations, and something magic happened there. It's something clicked. A lot of people come forward both with some with repressed memories, some joyous memories. I've had a tremendous amount of healthcare workers coming forward, people who were nurses, people who were social workers, people who cared for those boys who were dying because it was often covered in so much shame and so much fear that people didn't talk about it. It got kind of closed and sealed up. And we had a chance to open that up and say, look, let's talk about this. And a lot of people have embraced that. It's been really lovely. I'm sorry to say you've passed the threshold into a diagnosis of AIDS. Do you know what that means? Yes, I do. OK, we've got quite a few ways of approaching this and we're getting new information all the time. With this show, we thought we were going on air with a show that showed HIV to be a deadly disease. We're very worried about the amount that might look like misinformation, that might terrify people, actually. What we didn't take into account, there were all the people who do the real hard work, which is the charities and the activists and the campaigners and the politicians. We, you know, we come along as the newcomers going, hello, like this, and we're shiny and we're television, so we get a bit of attention. But the fact that that attention then shifts onto those people who are ready with the information, who are ready to save lives, 
was a wonderful thing. It became marvelously interactive between the program and the audience and people ready with information and people fighting misinformation as well. So that was, that was one of the joys of making it. It was a great time. He's such a beautiful boy, but you know what they say, don't you? You know what the age stands for? What? It stands for angels in disguise. They are preparing the way for his eternal life. He's very lucky. Yeah. Personally, it's been, it's been a relief that it being considered a success of it working, of having touched people. And there's tangible results, like there's one T-shirt, but there's a little catchphrase, la, in the show. That T-shirt's raised over half a million pounds for HIV charities. You know, you can talk about success, you can talk about awards. That's actual money that goes into educating people and helping people and reaching out into the community. That's been amazing. One of the great things to come out of the conversations about the show is the modern message, never mind the 1980s, right now, thank goodness, HIV is absolutely treatable. It's not deadly, but you must get tested. She were better love, a dream. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, the Academy, it's such a very great honor and to see people, I think, recognizing the cast and how good they are. Thank you, I really genuinely, from my heart, on behalf of that entire team, on behalf of the cause as well, thank you. If I could have a dinner party uh, with some TV characters, I'd have the cast of Friends, because then my, that would give me a lot of uh, points for my kids. Alf would be there to watch him eat. Red Fox, Urkel. Wefter, John Ritter, Felicia Rashad, <laughs> Michael Scott, come on. I mean, that's, yeah. that's great. I'd probably get the cast of Dallas and Dynasty in. That would be a laugh because there's got to be some gossip amongst those people. There's got to be some stories. Come on. Come on, Joan. Joan Collins, give me the stories. That's what I'd go for. I would have to say Mork because I'd love to see Robin Williams again and we just talk about food. I would have a Gus from Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad because, you know, I like my dinners to be murder mysteries. So let's see what he's going to do. I think I would have David Attenborough what a surprise. But I would also have Jeremy Clarkson. I think they would really annoy each other and it would be very funny to watch. <laughs> Joan from Mad Men, obviously. Uh, Sam Malone from Cheers. I mean, who doesn't want Sam Malone? Uh, and the entire cast of The Wire. Let's just have everyone there. Yeah, that's a crazy party, yeah. <laughs> I have a picture, and every time I look at this picture, it makes me emotional, of this little girl who had just gotten off the metro with her mom, and, you know, we were passing out flyers, and she just stopped. She was staring at the flyer. I asked her, I said, do you know her? Black and Missing is a four-part docu-series which focuses on two women, Natalie and Derricka Wilson, their sisters-in-law, and they created this foundation called the Black and Missing Foundation, which specifically focuses on missing BIPOC people. The inspiration behind the organization was a young lady by the name of Tamika Houston, who went missing from my hometown of Spartanburg, South Carolina, and her family really struggled to garner national mainstream media. And about a year later, Natalie Holloway went missing, and everyone knows that name, Natalie, but no one knew Tamika Houston's name. In my mind, I'm thinking, well, here's my niece. She's young, she's beautiful, she's missing. Her story is just as compelling. I was like, what in the world? Like, what is so different? And the only difference is that Tamika's black. Natalie Holloway is white. The Black and Missing docuseries gives a bird's eye view to the challenges that families face in getting media coverage and law enforcement resources you know, similar to their white counterparts. The viewers come alongside us as we search and the family search for their missing loved ones so we can bring them home. Soledad O'Brien, who's one of the executive producers on the show, actually came to me with this project. I think the issue was really important to her. I, I, I would describe my role as more like talking Derek and Natalie into doing the documentary. We knew that we needed to really get 
in deep with them to tell this story in the way it needed to be told. I cannot say enough about Nat Natalie and Derica. They're incredible women. You know, at the time we were, we were filming this, they were working full-time jobs. They were working mothers. They were taking their time to run the Black and Missing Foundation. And then on top of that, we said, and we also want to follow you around as you do all of this. At that time, my faith was wavering. And I remember someone had given me the number for Black and Missing. We received the intake form from Brandy. Immediately in reading over the intake form, I started to cringe. They knew that she was with someone that was not her caregiver. And that's one of the reasons an Amber Alert should have been issued immediately. We knew that we were gonna be working with the families of people who had gone missing and oftentimes already have been mistreated by the media. And we, we thought that having folks on our team who are representative of the community would help to create that level of comfort. This was a series that had all women of color directors. Often when it comes to diversity, I know because I've been doing this a long time and the conversations are always the same, it's like, we can't find any. Actually, you can find women of color who are directors and they can turn out a project that is multi-award winning. I called the police, they came to my house, they just talked to me and then they left. When I asked for the police report, the police reported her as, oh, she's just a runaway. You don't know the stigma as far as the police force is concerned. When they turn 16, they try to look at them as a young adult. So, you know, it's like her fault. We don't have to rush and look for her. We have been brought into national newsrooms to say, how can we do a better job with media coverage? I mean, that's something that we have been <laughs> trying to have happened for many years, and this docu-series really brought it to light. Even with law enforcement agencies, they want to work with us. They're saying, how can we use our platform to do a better job? And they're seeing how their stereotypes really impacts these cases. Because we've been able to change the way organizations think about how they're treating these cases, whether it's media, law enforcement, or the community at large. That is the reason why people think they've done such an amazing job. Someone in the Biden administration saw the series and invited Natalie and Derica to the White House, so they're, they're eager for, for some change to happen there. And after the series came out, an arrest was finally made in one of the cases that we profiled, and it was the first arrest in five years. A family member going missing. Yeah. It's gonna be all right. Just remember. It's no book wrote on, you know, how to deal with this or, or what you're gonna do. Um, but I know what helped me, and I hope that I'm able to help another family, even if it's just a little bit. No parents should have to live through this. Yeah. A strong so person like you can do it. To have this spotlight, this recognition, I am incredibly honored. And it really is confirmation that we are on the right track. It's a testament to the work that we do every single day. It's, it's an amazing way to say, you did it. You did exactly what you were supposed to do. And really, it's all credit to our directors who are phenomenal. For me, I really feel like I gained a community. and. I plan to champion the series as long as I can, because the issues behind it are, are so important and I will continue to be important. Since our inception, we have been able to close close to 400 cases. But think about if we have the resources, how many more that we can bring home. I'm very proud, but there's still so much more to be done. Congratulations to the 2022 Television Academy honorees and to these programs receiving special recognition this year. Thank you for your contribution to creating change in our world.